Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Lenten service for March 12, 2014. Tonight we continue the Lenten series, Crosswords. Tonight, Pastor Tim Barquette from Christ the King in Newberry Park brings us a message entitled, I Thirst, based on John 19, verse 28 to 29. Let's listen in. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're using our gospel text this evening for for the text that we're going to meditate on, uh, the text where Jesus says, I thirst. And and here it is for you. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be reflecting on words from the cross. And interestingly enough, you're going to have different men up here before you talking about different words from the cross. That seems very appropriate. And some of the words from the cross are, are, are amazing. There's some exceptional statements that Jesus does as, he, as he's there, as he's hanging, as he's dying for me and for you. Amazing statements from the God of the universe as he takes the sin of the world on himself. These last words of Jesus, filled with deep emotional pathos, if you will, filled with with gravitas in the Latin, right? This, This depth, this weight of the world on him, filled with meaning, profound words. And then there's I thirst. Maybe not quite as profound I, I, as, as I, maybe it, it's, it's a little bit lighter. Maybe it's a little more insignificant, a little more mundane for us. I, I thirst. I mean, come on, we, we all get thirsty, right? I thirst. And, and, and when I got this text, uh, I felt like I'd kind of drawn the short straw on these, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I thirst? Come on, guys. Give me, like, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You know, something, something bold, something strong, but I, I thirst? What is up with this phrase? Though, because I know when I read my scriptures that all of it is profitable for teaching. All of it is profitable to lead us into salvation. I know there's something here, something going on. So, so what is this little text, I thirst? What is it up to? That was the question I, I, I led myself with. And, and I found that actually I thirst is incredibly profound. Incredibly profound on the part of Jesus. Because first of all, it shows us his humanity. It shows us his humanity, which which is important. His physical suffering as he hangs there on the cross. That this is not just something kind of surfacey, not some kind of surreal thing going on. This is actually Christ, a human being dying on a real cross. A real implement of real Roman torture. Now, they tell us, the scientists, they, the scientists, tell us that, that our body is primarily water. I mean, anyways, for, for, for young children, infants, about 70% of them is water. I mean, you feel like you could wring them out, right? 70%. For an adult, we're right at 60%, and, and for elderly, wherever that starts exactly, it, it's a little bit, a little bit less. But, but no matter what, we are over half water. Over half of us is, is this amazing liquid called, called water. And we need to replenish it, right? If you exercise, you need to replenish it. If you go outside and you're, and you're cutting your rose bushes like I was this weekend, you need to replenish the water in your system. We need to replenish it. And so when Jesus says, I thirst, he's saying, I, I've got a real human body. Now we're like, okay, we're Lutherans. We, we know this, right? What's, what's the big deal? He, he, I mean, Jesus was, was God. He was man. He was two and one, the same thing. We hold that paradox to be true, right? We, we hold those things. But a lot of what we're losing here is an argument that, that I would say has been lost to history in many ways. It pops its head up every now and then. But it's this thing called Gnosticism. Gnosticism, this secret knowledge kind of thing. That said, Jesus has no body. 
Jesus actually was just a spirit, just a spirit. He never actually experienced pain. I mean, yeah, he touched people, but that was more of an illusion done by God. And this was the argument that, that, he, that he, he was just kind of this sort of spirit that could, that could move things around, kind of like a, a fancy ghost. But then we get, I thirst, parched, dry, physical suffering from Christ. It had been, give or take, 20 hours since he had had something to drink. How many of you had waited 20 hours to drink something? I mean, that's a long time. It's a long time. 20 hours since he had something to drink. He had been losing blood consistently. And the one thing they do when, when you lose blood is the first thing they do is they come in they, they, and, they, and they put a needle in your arm and they fill you full of liquids. Liquids. He'd been losing blood. It'd been 20 hours since he had a drink. He's suffering from, from his wounds. He's suffering from deprivation. He's suffering from exposure, from carrying his own cross up the hill. He's suffering. He's hurting. He's in pain. And after this, knowing that all is now finished, he said to fulfill the Scriptures, I thirst. Because he's suffering. He's in pain. And he's fulfilling the Scriptures. Don't, don't miss this part. Don't miss because this is a big deal. I mean, he's suffering. He's in pain. But he's fulfilling the Scripture. The psalm says, my strength is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue sticks to my jaws. It's, it's a prophecy from, from David of what the, the Christ will do, what the Messiah will be like. Which is amazing stuff. Psalm 69, for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Look at this. Hundreds of years before Jesus even shows up, they're talking about what's going to happen. Prophecy. Amazing prophecy in the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament, we could sit here kind of all night and go through these. We won't, but we could. 332 of them. Distinct prophecies about who Jesus was going to be, what He was going to do, the things that were going to happen to Him. We heard one from Isaiah this evening as, as we read the Old Testament text. By His stripes we are healed. It's kind of like this. The, the odds of Jesus fulfilling all of these prophecies is like this. If we took silver... You guys remember silver dollars? They used to have those around every now and then. My grandfather, when he'd go to Las Vegas, would bring us back his grandkids' silver dollars from Las Vegas. It was like we were waiting for him to come back because we always wanted the silver dollars that he would bring back. But if you had silver dollars enough that you could fill them two feet deep in the state of Texas, how many have driven across Texas, right? It takes all day. I mean, it, at, at least all day, maybe more. But if you filled the state of Texas from Amarillo to Brownsville with two feet of silver dollars, and you took one of those silver dollars and marked it, threw it out in the middle, mixed them all up, the odds of a man blindfolded walking out into Texas and finding that silver dollar is the same odds as Jesus fulfilling 332 prophecies. The same odds. Now, now that's, that's, those are odds I wouldn't take, right? I, I don't think you would either. And so Jesus suffered on the cross, fulfilled prophecy on the cross... Because he had to be human to save humans. If he wasn't human, if he was something else, he could not have redeemed us from our sin. He would not have been the sacrifice that was required to save us. He wouldn't have been the right one, the right thing. And so on that cross, in his physical body, he took the punishment for you. And he took the punishment for me. Completely. Totally. So we wouldn't have to. And so the second thing it brings us is that this thirst shows the depth of his suffering. Now, it's not just physical. I mean, it is physical, obviously. Hurts like crazy. I've never been crucified, thank God. Never have to, hopefully. But it was, by all accounts, the worst way to die. Period. The worst way to die. And so as Jesus says, I thirst, in many ways, it's a metaphor. <laughs> a metaphor as, long, as, as well as a very physical, very tangible statement. A metaphor for lacking God. 
for lacking God around him, with him, through him. Now, what are we talking about? Isaiah 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts. There's the metaphor, right? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Can't really drink him, although the scripture says to taste and see that the Lord is good, doesn't it? But my soul thirsts for God. Or again, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. This thirst metaphor, right? Thirst, this suffering without God. Again, I don't know how long you've gone without water, but to be really thirsty is an awful, horrible thing horrible thing and you'll take any water just about anywhere if you're thirsty enough any liquid but he's thirsty for something else as well probably more than anything more than just water he's been deprived of the father that's what the scriptures tell us he's deprived on the cross of the godhead itself now, 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 what are we talking about here? He says, follows my, here's the statement, right? After he says, I thirst, after he says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Where have you gone? And so he hangs there, forsaken, alone, thirsty physically and spiritually, thirsty for the Father. Because we know that loneliness can kill. They've done studies in, in some of the orphanages around the world. They find children in these orphanages that are dropped off, put into a bed. They're fed. They're healthy, relatively, but they're dying because no one touches them. No one picks them up. No one talks to them. No one carries them around. No one shows the pictures from their wallet of them. They die because of lack of contact. Now you take that into the context of Christ. Christ had been a part of the Godhead, a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost from eternity. From eternity. He had, there had never been a time when He had not been a part of the Father. When there had been a time when He had not been a part of the Holy Spirit. This Trinity thing was the essence of who He is. But on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now I thirst. He's separated. Separated from the Trinity. And so he thirsts for the Godhead. If there isn't hell on earth, he was there. Separated from God. That, that's literally, as I read the Scriptures, much of what I believe hell is about. Not being in the presence of God anymore. We'll never experience it in this world, in this life, because God is always here. Whether we believe He's here or not, He's here. That's the beauty of it. But true hell is the absence of God. And that's where Jesus was on the cross. Tragedy. I thirst. But the good news is, the gospel news is, Jesus did it so you don't have to. Jesus did it so you don't have to. Jesus hung there. Jesus thirst. Jesus was separated from God so you don't have to. By faith in Him. He thirst so you don't have to. What a blessed message that is. And He didn't just die on the cross. <laughs> he died for you. And on that cross, He said, you are forgiven. You are mine, and you never have to be thirsty again. That's what he said to us on that cross. What a, what a blessed message. And so he, he's, he's hurting physically, he's hurting spiritually, but there's one other thing that this statement of I thirst shows us. It shows us how Jesus is the supreme sacrifice, that he really is the sacrifice that we needed to be saved from our sin. He really is exactly the right thing at the right time in the right moment in history on the right cross on the right day in the right six hours. And it all comes to this little word hyssop. Hyssop. Go figure. 
You know what hyssop is? <laughs> it's a plant. Yeah, it's a plant. After this, Jesus, knowing, here's the text again, that all was finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst, and a jar of sour wine stood there. So they, 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 that's a typo, they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. (laughs) Hyssop branch. And as you read this, oftentimes we we go through this and we go, uh, yeah, it's, it's some tree they had around, they stick and put the thing, right? Unnecessary detail in the scripture. Well, no way, Jose. No, no way. No way. Right? There's no unnecessary details in there. This hyssop is a big deal. Because in the Old Testament, hyssop was used for sacrifice. Hyssop was used for cleansing. Hyssop was used in the temple. This is amazing. I'm going to just give you, I mean, there are so many, there's almost as many verses of this as there are prophecies of Jesus. I'm not going to give them all to you, I promise. But Exodus 12 talks about it once. Kill the Passover lamb. This is right, they're getting ready to leave Egypt. Kill the Passover lamb. Take a branch of, uh uh-oh, hyssop. Hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts and the blood that's in the basin. And then the angel of death passes over, right? The first Passover, their children live the firstborn of the Egyptians die. Hyssop. How about this one? From Numbers, when Moses is giving them the law, the sacrificial law, he says, purification, sacrifice, right? And the priest shall take cedar wood, and there it is again, hyssop. Cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire, burning the heifer. It's part of the sacrifice, part of, part of the, the ritual. And again, from Hebrews, as the writer of the Hebrews is talking about Christ, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool, right, referring right back to that verse we just had, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Talking about the book of, of the law, the Torah, right? Sprinkled the book with this hyssop. This branch is part of the sacrificial system. Again, purge me with hyssop, David says. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You see, Jesus is the supreme sacrifice. Dealt with with hyssop as a part of the purification system. Hyssop. A part of the sacrifice for you and for me the exact sacrifice we needed at the exact time. John tells his church this in his letter, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, just like the lambs did in the Old Testament. But now Israel was reduced to one in Jesus Christ, and his blood saves us all. Amazing. Hyssop. Who would have thought, right? And so as a result of all this, Jesus says to us tonight, this evening, as we talk about I thirst and meditate on the words of the cross, He says, come to me. Come to me, all you who thirst, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. (laughs) Rest. Rest. That's what we need. Rest in Christ. Rest in Jesus. Rest in His Word. And so let's go back for, to the metaphor just for one minute. What are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty for? Is it a physical thirst? Is it a spiritual thirst? What, what are you thirsty for? Maybe you've got a physical issue in your life. And nobody's got any answers. The tests come back. Doctors go, "Uh, we don't know. We're practicing. Maybe it's a mental issue, right? Maybe, Maybe you can't think straight, or maybe it's that thing that your mind is drawn to over and over and over again, and it draws you away from God, draws you into sin, draws you in into places you don't want to be. And yet you just can't seem to get rid of of that thing in your head over and over. Maybe it's an emotional issue. It just blew. Can't shake it. How, how How do you go on? 
Maybe it's a relational issue. That person, that person, right? We always say that. That person, it's their fault. But maybe it's a relational issue. Can't seem to get along. Can't talk to them. They don't listen to me. We don't communicate anymore. I don't understand. They don't even seem like the same person. Or maybe it's a spiritual issue. God, where are you? You used to feel so close. Now you feel like you're a thousand miles away. Where have you gone? And so we come to Christ with our thirst. And He says to us, I thirst so you wouldn't have to. He says to us, the answer is in Jesus. The answer is in Him. The answer is in His life and His death and His resurrection. The answer is found in the message that you are forgiven. And so in that forgiveness, He will show you a way. He will show you a way to keep going. He will show you a way to love. He will show you a way to serve. And He'll give you the motivation to do it. That's the nature of our Christ. Because He thirsts so you wouldn't have to. Ever. Ever. You know, I I always kind of used to chide at these signs a little bit. When you're driving down the highway, you've seen them. You know, see Jesus says, or the church will put it up, or you're driving through a town, they'll have the big, the big shiny cross with neon, and it's got all, you know, Jesus saves across them. I always thought that was kind of cheesy. I'm not so sure anymore. Because it's the truth. Jesus saves. And because of Him, you never have to be thirsty again. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.